Welcome to the Reality Revolution. This is one of the most exciting days on the podcast. I get to interview my hometown hero, Brant Tobler, from Cheyenne, Wyoming, 307 all the way. Uh, I've known and followed Brant my whole life because, you know, every, every town has that one dude that becomes famous. And so I've lived vicariously through Brant, like watching you on Sunday with Terry Bradshaw or drinking shots with Burt Kreischer, doing interviews with Jay Moore. It's just the coolest thing. I think everybody in Shine, so many people like live vicariously like, oh, dude, that's it's the coolest thing. But the thing that's cool about Brant, he's a great writer. Free Roll, one of the best books that you can read. I Have they bought the rights for this? Because I seriously, this is Tarantino-esque, man, all the way. We're working on it. I hope so. It's that kind of stuff's out of my control. So, oh man, this, but I hope so, man. So, um, on top of that, he's just one of the funniest people that I've ever met. Uh, you can see him on Comedy Central. He has a, a the podcast, The Thirty One, and and the uh, a fantastic YouTube channel. We're trying to get it over a thousand subs. So, if you watch us, go and subscribe. I'll put a link to Brand's YouTube channel. He is hilariously funny. There's so many stories. Of course, I've been following you so long. There's so many stories that are outside of it. We have so many interconnections, being that we're from the hometown, from the same place. But my podcast deals with reality creation and the law of attraction and metaphysics and, and how we deal with success. And so I have an episode. Um, it's, if you guys want to check it out, it's Reality Inversion. The idea is what the most powerful technique, even more powerful than a meditator or yogi, uh, to create reality and is comedy and humor. I'm a huge student of comedy and humor. I'm, I'm like Jerry Seinfeld. When I watch that show, he, he's like, he meets every single comic and wants to know everything about how, they, how they're funny. He's like he, that kind of fascination. Uh, you know, I've, I don't think you can teach comedy. Steve Martin, I, you know, of course I took his master class. I've never been very funny, but there's something about learning about comedy. It's, it's the hardest science. There's no actual book. There, you can't go take a class. You can, you can, and then if you hear something funny, well, of course you can't repeat that same joke because that's their joke. That's their funny. If you come to this place where you learn about yourself and people are, they live longer. I think that five minutes of, of laughing is, is as powerful as three hours of meditating. Uh, that's, that, that's my belief. And so um, I'm sorry to keep on going on, but I just want to introduce everybody. Brant Tobler, welcome to the Reality Revolution. Thank you. Thank you for that nice intro. And thank you for having me. So uh, one, I, I wanted to ask you that question. You, uh, if anybody reads your book, you had a bunch of like crises in your life where you easily could have just said, oh man, my life's so terrible. You know, you had like with your father, the story, if anybody reads the book about what, what happened with your father, how he wasn't there. And you had so many points in time, but you chose to ignore what was in your present reality and like had a vision of what you wanted to do and you followed it with like joy. So tell me more about that. I want to break it down. Like I'm like, if I wanted to, to follow your path, what have you learned? Tell me about it. Well, you know, to be honest, like people always say, did you dream of being a comedian growing up? And the truth is no, because growing up where we grew up, there was no comedy clubs. It, it just wasn't right. even a dream. I dreamed Giant of being had like no comedy a, clubs, right? Yeah, I'd be like a <laughs> PE teacher and like right. a JV basketball coach. But then I moved to Phoenix, and then eventually um, I started someone because I was like class clown in junior high, class clown in high school, and then one of my friends suggested I should try stand up. So, but I didn't know anything about it, and then so I, I thought about it, and then I a couple times I talked into a microphone, right, and like a in like a hotel conference room or something, just when there was a mic on, I could, but no one was around. And I talked into a microphone and it would, hearing my own voice amplified would make my eyes water. Yeah. So I was like, I can't be a comedian. Right. It's not very funny to sit up here and cry. So I chickened out, chickened out. And then eventually. I taught I, public speaking and it's one for just anybody just getting in front of the mic. Yeah. It's one of the greatest fears to overcome. And at the same time, you're trying to make people laugh. So you 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 how did you get to that point where you were like relaxed in your skin enough to get in front of these these crazy people that sometimes they're vicious man some of these crowds yeah. that <laughs> you know luckily my the when i first so i chickened out a bunch of times and i finally did it and i think that helped me because i was pretty prepared yeah but honestly i invited like 12 people 
and had a couple drinks and then I was like, I got it. You know, having all those people there kind of forced me to go up because I didn't want to disappoint them. It was one thing when I'd sign up and then I could just back out when nobody was coming, but Mm -hmm. all my friends, you know, got babysitters or took a night out from work or whatever it was. And then they came. So I was like, here we go. I got to do it. And then luckily for me, that first time went really good. And it, right. I was hooked immediately. And then uh, it, it's, I walked off stage that night and I was like, that was the coolest thing I've ever done. And then, and, and there was no turning back. Right. Tell me about that feeling when you get a group of people to laugh, that little moment in time when it's something that came from you, it's like genuinely you, it's your joke. It's not some joke you heard somebody else give and you have everybody laughing. Like there's this energy exchange yeah. almost, right? It's like better than any drug, right? Yeah. There's nothing like it because you, so I'll write something and then I'll go through that day going, you could, sometimes I think it's going to be great. And then it's right. not, which is another feeling. Yeah. But then when it, when it works and you're just like, it, it's just so cool to, you know, I, I keep a positive mindset about it because I mean, I get paid to do, I can go up there and make fart noises and people right. give me money. And so it's like, uh, once you, <laughs> once I figured it out, kind of the rush of it is, is so much fun. And it's like, uh, it's kind of a corny thing to say, like when you're in high school, your guidance counselor would be like, if you, if you love your job, you'll never work a day of your life. Right. And at the time I had crappy jobs and I was like, that's the dumbest thing. But like, I have a sold out show tonight I'm on and I'm just waiting for it, counting down the minutes right. where that's not working. So you're a comedy me. store every night. That's the one in downtown or the one near Ted's Montana Grill in, in the tech center. Which one yeah, are well, you? Well, there's, there's two of them. So we rotate. So last oh, night you do I, did, both? I did both. And then tonight I'm downtown. I've been to both and they're great clubs. I, I'm oh, just so excited. The fact that every time you, you go there, I've seen so many great shows there. You know, the audiences yeah. are great. Yeah. I, most people consider it the best club in the country outside of LA. And New yeah. York. So we're very spoiled. You, you get to work with the best comedians in the world. And uh, it, it's just set up for comedy. The, the key thing that we do here in Denver is they take everybody's phones and they put right. them in a, a yonder thing. So you can't be on your phone, which is such a, a help to us as artists. Cause then, there's nothing more frustrating than working on a joke and then looking down and seeing someone, the glow of their phone and their face. It's like, Oh, they're not even paying attention. Right. So, yeah. So I can get that 100%. So, yeah. We're, we're very spoiled here in Denver. After doing it for a while, there's a creative part. That's like being a writer or a musician where you, you have these moments that come to you. And so everybody has a different creative process. So, uh, you know, what is your, do you, do you just, do you write? Do you record? Do, do you like, do you have somebody you feed off of? I mean, what, what's your process, your creative process? So my process in the beginning, cause I didn't know what to do. This is like a, there's no real school for it. You can read a book, but honestly, right. there is not the, in the beginning, somehow I had like a rhyming dictionary and then I would, and it was just words that rhymed with each other. And then I would go through on a word and see if it, it, it right. jarred anything in my head. And then that caused me to write a lot of pun jokes. But then as you get better at comedy, you write about your life. So now if something happens in my life, I'll take a long walk and I'll just work it out in my head, work it out in my head. And then I'll go just try it on stage. I don't, I don't run it by, I run stuff a little by my girlfriend, but right. it's not fair to her. Cause if I think it's good, and then she doesn't like it. Yeah, I'm that's like, what she can say, right? Yeah, I yeah. get that. Or if she is honest, I'm like, well, you're that's negative. And then you, so you we, wonder about comedy in the age of puns. Like that's my kind. Like my kids get annoyed with me. I say yeah. no, no, none of my puns get laughs. But I'm like punning all the time, right? So there's yeah. a some point in time in comedy that some dude was like the first like pun. Like he got up and people were like, oh, right now you can't. There's no pun comedy, right? It's like, yeah, it's kind of. Like, frown- I mean, it's just what you do when you're. <laughs> You're starting out, but right. to me, the guys I look up to talk about their own lives. And, uh, right. and and then, like you said earlier, you can't use jokes. You can't, like, use another person's joke. It's not like a band where you can, you know, a band can play their new stuff, and if it's bad, they can just cover the greatest song ever. Like, we can't do that. So right. it's like the only rule in comedy is you don't want to do, have jokes similar to somebody. So that's why you just talk about your own life because then no one can say that, right. you know, you don't, you don't ever want to be on a show and, and have a similar pun joke or the same joke. Or if I talk about my life, it's, <laughs> right. uh, yeah, it's you, like there's that. a part of you that's always analyzing your joke. So that the thing about a comedian that's fascinating is you have to separate yourself from that part of you. That's always like critical of all your jokes. Right. Yeah. Right. The, yeah. So, know, yeah, you just learn to just go up there and fire away. And well, the, the key thing is once you realize that if you bomb, you're going to be okay. 
you know, everyone's like, what do you right. do if it goes bad? I go, I, I just get off stage like I do if it goes good. It's the thing is, is it's not a, it's a marathon, not a sprint. And, and once you realize that part of the process is bombing. So you actually like, sometimes I like to bomb as absurd right. as that is, because it gives you a different rush. Everybody bombs. Yeah, Every yeah everybody bombs, bombs. And then it's, it, it brings you back to starting when you bombed a lot. So, and it's funny, that's right. kind of the way the comedy gods work. Anytime I feel like I'm really good, the next show I have, You'll bomb. I'll probably bomb. <laughs> it's like, they just always remind you like, no, this the comedy is comedy gods. I like that. So, yeah. I mean, you know, I, when I lived in, um, I, I've been in Huntington Beach and walked in a club and Jay Leno is still playing. Yeah. Still doing stand up like almost every day, you know? Yeah. Uh, th it's that kind of a Jones, right? Like smoking yeah. cigarettes, right? You just love to do it. I mean, like, <laughs> like I did, I did both shows last night at the best clubs. And then I went to this awful open mic. That's just awful. And then I just ate it there. But right. Part of it's just a camaraderie about around being around comics. Once you become a comic, you just want to be around comics. Like you'll hear these right. guys like Seinfeld and Rock. They'll say, I'm at this big event, all these famous people are there, but I just find a comic across the room. I'm I'm drawn to them. So it's <laughs> it's a kind of secret like for fraternity. Soror I mean it I get that. I get that one hundred percent. Even just, the worst comics, the comics love each other. Yeah, That's yeah. what I noticed. Yeah. Because we were bad at one time. Right. So, yeah. You know, it's like People always ask me about starting comedy, and I'm like, you have it. Just go do it, and then you're one right. of us. It's the easiest fraternity to get in because no matter what, if you come up to me after a show and you're like, "Hey, man, good show," I'm like, "Thank you, I appreciate it." But if you're like, "Hey, great show," I'm a comic. I'll go, "Okay, hold on, stay right here. Let me talk to the people, and then let me talk to you." And then I and and then, you know, you could just talk. It. I could talk comedy all day long because yeah. I just love it. So it's it's a weird. It's the it's the best. Uh, addiction I think you can have right no I get but, that so. I mean there's other parts of it it's ruined a lot of relationships it's all of course it really is an addiction where so many t points in my life when it was like if a girl wasn't on board then I just said sorry you know like I gotta go to these shows and but they right. don't understand like I had I did a show last I did those two shows and I was at another show late but you're out working but you're also in a bar drinking and it looks like you're hanging out, but that's right. A lot of the job is networking and meeting people. And it's a weird right. dynamic that a lot of times a partner in a relationship doesn't understand because it looks like you're just out goofing around, but that's when you book shows and stuff. It's, it's such right. a weird, weird world. Yeah. So how, how dirty is too dirty? You know, it's just personal. <laughs> that's a personal thing. Right, right. It's like, no, but that would be the, the thing that would start, okay, I want to tell some jokes, but how? You, that's going to be a question that came to your mind at some point, right? You were like, how dirty is too dirty, right? Yeah, Did, well, that dirty, tell right? you, well, that's the thing. I always tell people, there's no rules. Right, there people, is no they, rules, but still there's rules. You, you have your own you rules, want. right? So. Yeah, well, the rules just be funny. If you can be dirty and be funny, then you'll be fine. But if you're dirty and you're not funny, you're going to have more of a problem than if you're clean and not funny right. for me. So it, comedy went down into this bad place and we're bringing it back where right. everyone was so woke and offended by everything. So the PC culture like has changed everything. Like, yeah. College campuses, college, you can't do those college tours anymore because it doesn't matter what you say, right? Whatever, yeah. whatever you say, there's going to be some side that's going to be offended in some manner. Right. Yeah. And, but that's what, but it's coming back around and like and over time you just realize like every night I know I'm not going to make everybody happy and I don't want to like my analogy if you come to my show it's like getting in a car with me and we're going to go for a ride and sometimes I might go a little faster than you want or I might go a little into a right. dark neighborhood you don't like but I think that's better than the comics that I see that just pander and go up there and just say to me when you pander like that that I compare it to getting in a car packing as many people as you can get in a car and then just staying in neutral. Like that's not fun. Right. I guess it's safe. You're never going to get in a crash. You're never, but it, it's not to me, the comics I look at up to take chances and like, and I do bits now. That's what's inspiring. When I see someone come in, like when Chappelle comes or somebody right. and they take chances and then, they take chances, right? Yeah, you don't want to make yeah. everybody happy. Like Chappelle says, like, I could say something now and my whole career is over, right? Just one thing, right? So. Yeah, but <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, and right? people try to cancel it. It was bad for a while, but I think people, it got too far. 
Right. And then society, it was like a 10% wild. And then society got so PC, it brought it down to like 1%. And then everyone's like, ah, we don't want it this far down. Let's try to find a happy medium. It's like a happy medium, right. Which is still, but like Chappelle's out there as a voice for all of us. Like, you know, you don't tell us how to do comedy. And we don't know. Like I said, I don't know. I'll try something I think's funny. And then it won't work. Or, 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 you know, someone will come up to me and be like, oh, that joke. I have a brother that's whatever. And it's just like, okay, I don't know your brother. I don't know. But the rest of the crowd didn't. Like, I always say, we're we're just, we just want to make you laugh, man. We don't. And if you don't like it, then just go on with your life. Just go on. Right. Yeah. If you go see a band you don't like, you just go home and you never see that band. You don't walk up to them and say, you know, that song, it really offended me because of my brother. You don't say that with the song, right? Yeah. I get that. That's the other thing is like, if you're going to a band, you do a little research. You don't just go to a venue and go, whatever it is, heavy metal, country, Christian. Right. Whereas comedy, you just show up. I'm on the marquee. I'm all over the internet. You could have Googled me. If I'm a little, if I talk about stuff you don't like, then just go to something else. But for some reason, people are so entitled. They think going to a comedy show, it needs to be the comedy they like, which you would never do that. You could never right. go to a music venue. And let's say you like country music and they're playing heavy metal. You couldn't go over to the manager and be like, why are they playing heavy metal? I don't right. like heavy metal. It's like, well, that's what we do. You could have done it. Right. So stuff like that. So frustrating. And people just love to complain, you know, like, but we're lucky that we, Wendy, the owner of the clubs here backs us and she understands like, right. you know, and, and so, some people get mad at the start of a joke. They don't even see where it goes. Right. They just, some people, I've been in crowds where people clearly just came there to be mad. Like beforehand, yeah. they were mad yeah. when they walked in. So you get that so how so the next question how soon is too soon <laughs> again if it's funny <laughs> right no because that's you know, always going to be a question how soon is too soon right for me if, <laughs> if it's funny because once again it's a different answer for everybody in the right, crowd right. it's a personal it's a science comedy is one of those sciences there is no exact answers but it does deserve deep study because every yeah. time I learn and watch different comedians, I learn more, even though I'm not a comedian myself, there is something to it. There's something about this energy. I think it's like an almost an end of spirit energy of laughing that you can see it in your, when you're in a room, when everybody starts laughing, it's almost like the higher vibration occurs, right? Yeah. You've seen crowds, what you've been in and it just like they become, it's a rolling crowd of energy, right? Just from your laugh, the laugh has this power. Yeah, when, it, when you get a, a crowd can go, when it gets together like that, those are the best nights. It's like a pendulum, but it's like a positive pendulum. You're using, you're getting, people are getting something back from it. Yeah. Like, I love it. Right. On those nights, then you're just like floating up there. It's like, you just come off and you're like, that was crazy. You know, it was crazy I remember feeling. just watching a Pearl Jam show up close and thinking the same thing. Like they're just riding this wave of energy from the yeah. crowd that's coming down. It doesn't even matter. You know, there, there's this other thing that happens. People don't even really talk about that. They go to live shows. There's this other energy. It's it's yeah. truly amazing, right? Yeah, that's why I'm a I'm a, I love going to. I'll go to pretty much any live. Yeah, you, I've watched live. your face. You've gone to like every national championship and yeah. it, it, whatever event you're going to go. Cause, and so that's but part that, of a comedian is that feeding on that group energy almost a little bit, right? Yeah, it's the energy. Like and a group it, energy it's vampire. A, it's the only, <laughs> yeah, it's the right? only way I can find that energy if I'm not performing. Like, I can't really go to a movie. I haven't been to a movie forever because it doesn't. I mean, a laugh in a movie together is cool, but like for me, I, I'm I'm a big energy guy. Like I like the moment. I like the the hair on my arms to stand up in a sporting event or in a concert or or at a, a show. Like so so theor- just coming to me a theoretical. If we can tune into that group energy, we can. T- if if you if you're wanting to be a comedian or you want to be a comic or feed into a some anything that involves a group tuning, what you're telling me is something that I would pull from as a like a secret technique. Like you're 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 feeding on that energy outside of you just performing in crowds you're just that, that's just become a you you're at that frequency right you kind of yeah. like seek it out naturally you don't even think about it right you're it's the more of that in your life the more you feel it even in in your crowds that you're on right yeah for sure i'm just drawn to that like if i'm just walking through a neighborhood and then i hear hear that crowd noise or something i'm like i gotta go <laughs> yeah. and i want to see it and i want to feel and then I, I i like watch other performers and i like just the the whole energy of like, it, there's nothing better than than seeing it live, 
So, uh, I, so I before think you do a stand up, do you visualize your, your move? Like, do you visualize your movements of how it's going to look when you're looking out on the crowd? Do you go into the moment of it as if you're delivering it or how do you practice it out in your mind? You know, in my mind, I don't, in my mind, I'm more thinking about the jokes and not the crowd. Cause you can never, you know, for instance, like when you start, if you visualize the crowd, you visualize, you know, the room or whatever, but then you come out right and early in my career you come out and and then you look at the crowd and everybody be having fun except for one person and then for some reason you focus on that, on that one, one person. person right so you don't so now in my head i just visualize you know i don't visualize it as much i probably should i there's other comics that do that but it's hard to visualize because you never know what's going to happen Right. So when I come, I'm just you visualize the feeling. Do you, 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 you try to bring up that feeling of what the joke's going to feel like if it's successful when you tell it? Does that make yeah, sense? Well, like when you try, does that make sense? Yeah, no, in my head. But then so, sometimes it's just not successful. So in, your, right. in my head, I always do think, oh, this is going to crush. And then as I write it in my head, when I come out, there'll be pauses where I assume there'll be laughter. So I visualize right. the laughter. But then sometimes those pauses, there's no laughter, and you're like, "Oh crap, this is not <laughs> how we visualize this." Right. So it's like, uh, it's just definitely in the moment because I don't really know what I'm. People are always like, "Do you know the what you're in the do? moment?" The better. That's why yeah. those improv comics were the best, like Robin Williams and those dudes yeah. that didn't come prepared at all, right? They would. That's that's the rush that. of it. Like I love writing material, so if I write something new tonight and it works, I like that for like the first week, but then. What I really like is last night, like I went off the cuff and I was talking to these people. And then if you nail it right there and the crowd, that's when you get the biggest energy. And they know too that it's when they go, oh, this guy just did that. What he just did was so good. And he just did it. It, Sometimes people come up after and go, hey, did you guys plan that? And I'm like, I don't know that, dude. I have no (laughs) idea. That's the most frustrating. But for me, that's why I'm so fascinated by it, because you're tuning into almost an outside of your body energy that takes over. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. And that's the energy again when you feel like you're floating like when i came off last night like i i just had a line that i just that's when i'm the most happy too when i'm like right and that was cool where i you know when i just do the same stories over and over or jokes and you're perfecting them and okay you change a word or you put something in that makes you feel good but in the moment when you just hit when when they say something and then you say something right back and then the crowd's just like right and that's the feeling when you're like That'll keep you up at night. Like, that's why it's hard to come home right. and go to sleep. So living in LA and for a long time, I've yeah. had so many friends that are comedians. And the thing I've noticed, I want to ask you about is, and you lived here for a while. And even yeah. if you're living in Denver, part of the process of being a comedian is uh, the thousands of auditions and, and hopes that you get up. People tell you you're going to get this gig or that job. And there's so, it's just that you're, li- you're constantly being told of stuff that never happens. And yeah. then it's like, you know, you get that one thing, but it's the thing that you're balancing that people aren't aware of is that you're going to have, you've had like a hundred things told you that you're going to get like for sure, like movies and gigs and right. And it seems like every comedian, it's like, a hundred times it's like there's no doubt and then it's like something happens and it's like so you have to always be like some people when they get that told no or it doesn't work out they just become so devastated it becomes so important like they like they you know they can't go to the next right yeah so you probably put together some ways of dealing with it because i when you were in how many auditions did you go to how many times how many oh there's a million you can hear a, about right a million times when people it's ridiculous take and that's how la it's is unbelievable people people think that if they're watching it's like 10 or 12 no we're talking about thousands like a daily thing of being constantly told no not, not right now right yeah in the nicest most polite way <laughs> yeah so like a thing a lot of people think that you have to have like a bad childhood to be a comedian or have a rough life right growing up but that's not true, but I think it makes you ready for stand-up because stand-up is just up, down, up, down. So yeah, like all the time. as weird as it is, my, I, like in the book, I talk about how I just had a bad father that was in prison and he would come and he would show up and we, there'd be these amazing highs. And then he promised me that he'd be there and then he wouldn't show up and it, you know, crushed me at like a 10 year old birthday party or something. But you kind of got a way of dealing but with it. But in some right? weird way, like yeah. going through the, when I got to LA, you know, when I first got there, I believed it every time I would, you know, I'd say, oh, this is going to happen. And then I'd call back home. I said, I think I got this. And then 
you realize then you don't get it and then everyone back home's like uh i thought you're gonna be on tv this week and then they don't understand so now it's like now so like even with my girlfriend i'll get a big email and a lot of times i won't even tell her right because it doesn't matter until it it happens you just you know it's just a lot of people anyone can write anything they want on an email to actually do it but the beauty of stand-up the beauty of entertainment and everything is what we're doing right now. You just do it yourself. Right. That's the thing that I learned is like, but let me you, ask you this. I teach this on my podcast. Uh-huh. So the ones where you don't make them too important are the ones that seem to happen the most often, right? The ones that you, Oh, that one's so important. I've got to get this one. Those are the ones that don't right? the ones that you yeah. put on the pedestal. Am I right? Yeah, for sure. And a, a lot of like famous actors will say that like when they, when they cared the least is when they got it and when right. they cared, but when they just went in the room and they were themselves and like, when it's, it's hard sometimes, cause it's, it would be so cool. Right. So yeah, yeah. you might get right. So yeah, so it's a can weird, imagine like in that moment, okay, I'm not going to make this important. Not this time. Right. It's yeah. hard. Right. It's like a learning experience. I bet. Yeah. A dude, a dude posted something today about he had a meeting in his early twenties and he, he went to the gym every day and worked out and bought a new outfit and everything. And he right. went in and nothing happened. And now in his early 40s, he took a meeting yesterday, didn't shower or anything, just went in there. And of course, he like got it. But that's the thing you don't know until, right. you know. I do think the, that there is a, there's a link or, or to that. Like the ones that you kind of just do, it's cool. I think even you probably perform better or whatever in those moments that you reduce the importance of it. It's kind yeah. of a zen-like thing. You learn, I think, you're learning something else doing comedy about just life. In general, yeah. it kind of applies to everything, you know? It's well, the, a weird energy that I've been talking about a lot with my girlfriend lately is that it's just like if you just do the work, the right. the, the world will just bring you opportunities. Like, I, I've worked harder in the last couple months than ever, and it's like, and just stuff just comes. Right, like, just I, do I, the work. I, Stop hoping or wanting, and, 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 and all that is time that you could be doing yeah the work right so yeah. I, I i think that you people, just said like a super a master key for people that are in a similar situation it doesn't even have to apply to comedy i just think for people that are trying to move up or be successful in whatever industry we can learn lessons from what you've been through because you've had it on a maximum scale like some people go job interviews and they deal with two or three and imagine what for a comedian imagine going on a thousand job interviews <laughs> right yeah. you're constantly going on job interviews and being told that you're going to get the job all the time right until the last minute <laughs> yeah yeah so. then you just don't know well that's like what i'm most proud about with my book is like i never thought i'd write a book right and people always ask me how did you do it i said i just did it man i sat down you know i think the first thing i wrote was like i wanted to dedicate it to my grandparents so i wrote that which is like a two cent thing then i came up with like a title then i came Right. I just did it and I just worked on it. And there's people always looking for a shortcut. I would have to say one of the biggest motivations for me writing my book was, Hey man, Brent did it. I can do it. I'm sure there's yeah. people there that have said that to you too. Right? Like you did it. Um, it gives me like, Hey, that means I can do it too. Right? Yeah. Like, I, and that's it's what... so well written. If you did that, the, um, the stories in it, I, I wish we could have time on this podcast to go over them, but I'm sure you've told some of those stories hundreds of yeah. times. <laughs> and I, and I want people to read them for the first time. Cause they're so insane. The stories yeah. in free roll are so insane. So I was, I know everything about that. The reason it's special to me is that I, that mall is my mall. And my dad and I was my special relationship with my dad. When I would go and visit or even during high school, we would always meet for lunch at that pizza place that you were at. So we would always meet for lunch because that was our dad would have lunch. Okay, Brian, let's meet like at 12, right? We'd meet and we'd eat there. And I knew all those guys you were describing in the book. I knew, and I had those same like thoughts. And I remember the, the Walden books right there and the, the mall, the whole, the whole setup. And you have like the mall mafia story is so hilarious. So <laughs> please read the book. I'm not, I don't, we, yeah. we, can, we can go with that again. But the thing about the book that really struck at me is that you had these incidents that anybody else, they would be freaking out. Like I lost this incredible amount of money or my dad did this or something terrible, right? And yeah. you always found a way of in those moments to react in almost a humorous manner. And it's reason for your success. Like you could have had that stuff just completely destroy you. Right. I yeah. want to talk about you kind of like it helped you, you like you had big stuff happen. You were like, that, that stuff's not going to matter. I'm going to keep doing what I want to do and find my goal. Right. Yeah. Again, it's like cheesy advice, but I just tell people, you just got to keep going, man. There's, you, you just got to keep right. going. I didn't know. And, and some of the stuff that at the time, 
like I ha- about a couple months ago, I had a real like weird week where I, th- I really thought about some decisions in my life. Right. And if, if a certain thing would have went wrong, different in that five minutes, my whole life would have been a whole different. Right. I mean, like just simple things of like at an audition, if I'd have done this, I would have probably lived in New York right now. I wouldn't have my girlfriend. I wouldn't do everything on the most little uh, decisions. And then, and it's just some producer not- out there is watching this right now. And I'm just telling you, read the book. There's some scenarios in that book that are so classic for a movie, such incredible tension, like Quentin Tarantino style stuff happening that, and you added humor to it like in, in the most improbable of ways and you're able yeah. to get through it that it's amazing you can joke about it or anybody else they'd be in prison or some other crazy thing right <laughs> that you went through so well yeah that's what i learned earlier is just just laughter makes everything better and and yeah. like that's been my defense mechanism is i'm not like a tough guy or like i i just figured out humor humor works with everybody you know like yeah. No one doesn't like to laugh. So I figured out early in life, like the, just being funny, it's it just always benefited me. So then I, 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 I don't know how much you work on. I mean, I, I guess I work on it, but part of it, I think is just natural. Part of it, I guess, is who I'm around. Right. Growing up, you know, I can't, cause honestly, my mom's not funny. <laughs> People always ask me, how'd you get funny? And I, I, I would, I guess, okay to the that, kids right? I grew up with, but a little bit of me just thinks you're born with it. Like, yeah. Cause I don't, there's no reason in Cheyenne I should have, you know, there was no, it just wasn't a thing to be funny, really. Right. So it doesn't matter your circumstances, what your family is, that the brand story will tell you that it doesn't matter what you're going through right now, what, what t- small town you're living in. It doesn't matter. You can still achieve your dreams. It, it yeah. doesn't matter if you're in Podunk, Wyoming or Cheyenne, Wyoming. Right. So yeah. um, I always tell my friends, friends. Brant kept his hair because I lost mine because of the wind <laughs> just in Cheyenne alone. Right. That's the truth. <laughs> so you, you, um, this is unrelated, but you, you remember the first time we met, no? No, when was it? We had Thanksgiving dinner. It was a Thanksgiving at the Mullikens. You were hanging out with Thea at oh, the time. Yeah, yeah. And you had come over during Thanksgiving. That was the first time I met, right? That's crazy. That's, we, we have a love for the Broncos and Martha Mulliken. Yeah. The, the, she's, the, she's the coolest, right? So she was I remember coolest. that. But, they um, had a trampoline. And you were a pretty good basketball player too, right? Yeah, that was all I, I spent my whole life in hindsight. I wish I'd have done like theater or anything that would help my career right now. I would but. say that everything that you did was perfect. Because yeah, yeah. It brought you to no, this that's point. like like I, I don't said, think it all change anything. You know, it all uh, it all got me to here to do. You know, I, I like I say in my book, I outdream my dreams. I never dreamed I'd do any of it. I mean, I have two CDs. I wrote a book. I've performed all over the world. I mean, I've never grown up in Wyoming. I just never even. It wasn't even a, I never, in fact, I lived in Hollywood right. for eight years. I never even, th- I thought maybe I'd go to California once in my life or so. I don't even right. think I ever thought I could do it. So that's what's crazy about it is like. But I get people that, that message me that say, hey, I, I live in this terrible town or country or something. Yeah. And you know, I'm saying, I'm, I promise you, it does not matter. If you yeah. just, if you decide on your dream and you go for it, there's people I meet like you all the time that don't let that bother you. Right. Yeah, we we could be doing what we're doing wherever you live. There's right. always excuses, like not right. to make it all motivational, but I'm telling you, just start. If you have a, just go. You just got to start going. And then, like people ask me with the book, you know, I so I had a title. Then I was like, let me get like a thousand words, and I got it. And I was like, let me get twenty five hundred, and then let me get to five thousand. And I was motivated by numbers, but over time it was right. growing. And then all of a sudden I was like man, I'm at 20,000 words to the point when I got the book done and I'll never forget, I got the book, my first copy and I was holding it in a Chick-fil-A and, and I just started crying. I was like, this is my book. I, I couldn't believe that I had wrote a book. I, I never went to college. Yeah. I dropped out of Did you imagine college. that beforehand holding your book in your hand? Yeah. Well, yeah. as it, as it grew, you as know? it grew, you started to imagine holding it in your hand. And then I would like, and then I was like, that day will come. And it was so worth it. But even the way I visualized it, I never knew how much it would mean until I had it. And then I, I'm holding that book and then I'm telling myself, what if no one buys it? And then I said, who cares? I wrote a book. This right. is a book that'll be here forever. And then, of course, people bought it. And, and then that's like the nicest thing. You know, it was kind of a funny to show how much people didn't think I could write a book, including me. Then all my friends and family and people, everyone bought it. And I right. would get this message a lot. It'd be like, 
I just bought your book because I love you, but it's actually like it's really actually pretty good. good. <laughs> no, I, I I remember going, okay, I'm gonna buy it anyway, and I was yeah. like, holy shit, this is really really good, you know? Yeah. Wow, so, I couldn't believe all the stories, right? It spoke to me, of course, because I grew up in Cheyenne, yeah. right? So, but that's the thing, I'm so proud of it, and if I don't sell one ever again, you know, I see it sitting next to you right there. There's one, my first copy sitting here in my studio, and sometimes I'll just glance at it, and no one, and and it. I didn't write it for money or anything. I hope it gets made in the movie and all that, but, and it's made me money. It was cool, but there's no, I didn't know that feeling until I, and, and I right. have it. And it's so like, you got another one coming? Cause I'll, I'm, I'm buying it as soon as you see yeah. it. Out. I'm on well, the list, right? Yeah, no, no. I wrote, I have another one almost done. And then uh, I'm in a, I'm in a personal dilemma with it because I really am in love with the girl. I have, I've been dating a girl a little over a year. And but this book that I wrote is called You Couldn't and You Wouldn't, and it's ten <laughs> right. stories about girls I had sex with that most dudes couldn't, and ten stories about <laughs> sex that I wouldn't. had with girls that wouldn't. So <laughs> she's got to uh, understand. I got to read that book, man. Come yeah, on, man. so it's good. It's really funny, and it has some great stories. But I've been, um, it, it's just been a debate of uh, because I really I've never been married. I really want kids, and I don't. Just tell her about it. I think she'll understand. Yeah, no, she's she been cool. She cool, said, right? she said, you could do it, but then, you know, I've had people in my past tell me they could do stuff, and then right, no, you no, just no, never want to hurt someone's feelings. And it was a book I wrote when I was single, and then to, you know, have to read all these stories about me having sex with other people. Um, it's just something I, I'm debating right. what I, 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 it's not, I really, I'm really in love with this girl. And I, it's not, I don't want to hurt someone feeling or ruin a relationship. Like I so everybody put book. comments on this video right now, telling her that it's okay. <laughs> Explain that it's okay. See, sometimes those are the things when you come from the heart, the stuff that's dangerous a little bit. Yeah. The ones that are, are the best, right? Well, I th I'm proud of it. I think it would be life changing because it's, it's very vulnerable and real. You've like also I, had like a, a famous movie star sleep with one of your girlfriends. Yeah, yeah while no, you're it's, with <laughs> so it's all in there. You got both sides of it, right? There so, is uh, there is some incredible of the book stories. Could be your girlfriend now. That's why it would be a great. It's a redemption story, right? The, the yeah. ending of the book is a, it's a love story, right? Yeah, you know what? That's a great idea, actually. Maybe you know? that's how. I mean, that's how the movies always would be. Like it's like. 10 you know and at the end it's like that one girl that's always the one that you that's the one right so yeah it's made for like the perfect uh perfect movie you know right there i didn't i never that <laughs> might be the way i do this and then that would be and make her a part of the story make and her make the, her the final beginning part. And the end right yeah that's a good <laughs> you know that's a great idea honestly and then i could still publish it without hurting her feelings and saying <laughs> that's a really good idea actually. i think that i think we figured it out man. yeah i'm gonna have to pitch it to her tonight but <laughs> yeah because right. it sucks because i did i worked so hard on it and it was almost done right when i met her and then uh, right and now it's like well i get that because there was a time when i could have published books and I was like, my parents are going to read that, man. I, yeah. And they're going to think I'm completely insane or crazy with some, because I like, I never would have had my podcast if my parents would have been around, you know, they're not around. And it's part of just me. I know they would have been totally cool with it. Right. But I was always thinking about what other people would think. And it stopped me from doing what I wanted to do. Right. I think yeah. we always have those thoughts. Right. I yeah. Think no, it's cool, you know, <laughs> like my parents don't think I'm crazy, you know, so, <laughs> right. I get yeah, it. Yeah. No, it's awesome, man. And now you did it. Right, right. So, I, I, but the the thing that, that is related to the podcast that we kind of got at earlier was, uh, I believe that we create our reality with our thoughts. That's a big part of it. I, I'm trying to, to go through the dynamics of that. And it's really fun to meet somebody that I think that one of the keys to creating reality is tuning into the energy of comedy. Because when you, when you have a problem, if you can find some comedy in it, it reduces it. If you can, it, and also to talk to a comedian, it's like you're at like an, an intense, maximized level of trying to reach success on a daily basis with a thousand different things. So you're actually experiencing like a quantum computer of success. Like it's not just, there are people out there that have one dream and you have like thousands of them that uh, there's, that's part of what you have to do to do what you're doing, right? So yeah, it's interesting. Have you found any techniques or things that help that you could suggest to people that may not be comedians as to like you know future success or people that are trying to achieve their goals kind of like what we've talked about 
Yeah. Well, I think the visualization for sure is, uh, is something I would have learned about more or earlier in life, just as far as even sports wise, the few times when I really focused and visualized what I wanted to accomplish before were some of the best games I ever had. Now at the time, I don't think I was probably mature enough to have that focus. Unfortunately, it was like, right after I graduated high school and, and they were meaningless, like city league find basketball out games yeah. or something. But I did when I was like, this game's important and it's Friday night. And on Monday I started visualizing I, and, and those were the best games I ever had. And as comedy wise, I, I mean, I, I guess you do visualize. I mean, I visualized doing the tonight show or when I did the comedy right. central thing, I visualized that moment of, of just being ready for the moment and just right. so i think to me the visualization is definitely a key a key part of any success because then if you think about it, it it's just part of it just being prepared right which so the visualization just kind of prepares me for it and then there's been times when i visualize something bad happening and then it did happen right well and it, i was like it goes oh, both ways yeah yeah so it's uh it's very powerful. It's something I'm fascinated by. And I think you also have extra power when you're accessing comedy all the time. It's like your visualizations happen faster. Yeah, That's yeah. my theory. I, I, there's no way for me to prove it. But my theory is that when you're accessing this energy, it's like this creative energy, this free, joyous, creative energy, like your visualizations, bam, they're happening way faster. Yeah. What do you think about that theory? Right? No, I agree that yeah, so I could visualize days out, but then even in the moment, I can visualize something about, because like if I'm doing one of my jokes that I've done, so if I'm doing like, let's say a story that's seven minutes long, but I've already perfected it, a lot of times I am actually in the moment, that story is like on cruise control, I can perform that story, but think about something totally different, right. which is key to thinking about so let's say I do like a story, like that story about the famous person having sex with my girlfriend. I've worked on it. I've perfected it. I don't really need to mess with it. But as I'm telling it, so then part of my brain is like, okay, when this ends, we're going to go this direction next. Right. Or if, when this ends, this table over here is not paying attention. So I, I can, I'm saying words and it looks like I'm, I am performing but honestly, the comedy's on cruise control because I'm so used to doing it. Mm -hmm. Like if you were driving, you're going to get there. But, I'm, but in my head, I'm like, okay, this is going to end in about 45 seconds. When it ends, do I go to the next story or joke or do I address this? And if I address this, I can see in my head this is probably going to be a problem. And then... So I think there's a myth, and I want to explore the, this other part mm -hmm. where it, it, with comedy. Um, People say, well, uh, comics, it's just, there's a darkness behind all comedy. Look at Robin Williams, look at, you know, uh, other comedians. I, I don't believe that. People have this belief that all comedians have this deep, dark, suicidal, they're all depressed in, in the background. And I, um, do you, with p your friends and comics that you meet, do you really think that's true? Because no, they, I, there's this I, think, thing, uh, right? I think comics glamorize it a little bit. Like any job, there's some ups and downs, but right. like, I'm not, you know, I always say no stress express. That's how I live my life i don't really sweat anything and when i had bad days in la so I, I live with two guys from seattle and and when one of them would have a bad day i would remind them hey man we live in hollywood we're stand-up comedians like right. we never dreamed it this is crazy you never thought you were gonna do this like i always say i want to be a pe teacher so i don't right. you know you go through the ups and downs but i think people glamorize it especially maybe on social media for attention a lot but right. if you're not enjoying this life, like, you know, I don't, I, I'm talking to you, doing whatever I want. And then tonight I'm going to go do a sold out show, say the whatever freak. I want. They're going to give me booze, food. People are going to come up afterwards and shake my hand, take pictures and give me money. Like, you know, and I don't know what Robin Williams or some of those people are going through, but I think in any profession, you know, people, there's depression in any job, but I think right. somehow in stand up, like I said, it got glamorized. Skin magnified and, people, and right. people like to victim and be like, I'm Well, you can't be funny without these dark, yeah. dark, sad yeah. thoughts that you have. And I don't think that's true. I just think there's some yeah. people who are just genuinely funny. And, and I think maybe the dark stuff made me be funny as a coping mechanism of like, but you don't have to be like, I don't, I think it's a myth. Like I said, I think a lot of us comics, 
did have a, a rough childhood or rough points in our life. And right. that's what keeps us going because we've been through, we've weathered the storm and made it out where if you're a spoiled rich kid, comedy's not for you because you've been given everything you've ever wanted. And this, the crowds aren't just going to, your daddy can't pay the crowd to like you. Right. So if you, if you don't know how to go through the ups and downs, you're not going to make it in comedy because no matter, you know, you, you, like I said, your dad can't pay for people to like you or right. buy you. So, so you who's, can't who's buy the you funniest less. comedian that you've ever heard? The funniest one I've ever heard? Yeah. Oh, man. Pretty hard to do, huh? Well, my favorite comedian is Mitch Hedberg. Mitch growing Hedberg. Up. Love he Mitch Hedberg. He was the first one oh, that yeah. I really fell in love with. And then, you know, I, I like storytellers. So what I really like is guys that I – what motivates me now is guys that I used to open for – in front of 75, 100 people are now selling out arenas and stuff. So, right. like, but I mean, like, I think Chris Rock's great, Seinfeld. There's so many that are, they're good in any genre. Like, Brian Regan is incredible, super clean. Uh, Chappelle, right. it, it's hard. It's, it, it's hard. It's such a hard thing to answer yeah. as a one, as, especially because, you, and, and the thing is with comedy, they always say you don't want to meet your heroes. This is the opposite. The you bigger, want to meet your heroes, the right? The bigger comic I've met, the, the cooler they were. Because they know, like we talked about earlier, they know what you've been through. So not only are my favorite comics my favorites, but they're also have become friends because they're they're just cool. We have that bond yeah. of, of doing it. So, you know, but the, what I would say is wherever you're at, wherever you're listening to this at, just go see live comedy because there's so many really really, really good comments are. that people have never even heard of and it's uh and we and we need people always i mean people always come out but if you're in somewhere weird in like montana or idaho or someone they're doing a show you should go out because you'll be surprised or you'll be surprised so, so the funny. funniest comedian you've heard like live like been to and seen live like the it's crowd funny. was probably uh, Chappelle. probably Chappelle. I mean, Chappelle just crushes but he there's like a cheat code when you're famous as far as like you're going to be funny anyway. You're just kind of starstruck. They always say you get that first 10 minutes for free, just with the audience's mind of like, this is a celebrity in front of us. Right. But Chappelle is, is great. Like I love Burt Kreischer. I love Tom Segura. I mean, there's so many, there's a guy named Ian Bag that just does all crowd work that that is great yeah. every single time because it's different. But to me, the best comedian in the world is probably Chappelle. And then I like earlier Chris Rock and earlier the, the but i like the special that made him famous because right. now that they're famous you can't really relate to them because you know they're just famous they they have they're too famous to tell their real stories that are vulnerable but then they talk about private jets and sh i don't care about that well I eddie like murphy raw back in the when eddie murphy yeah eddie murphy was so good and so i'm ashamed of it but I, early bill cosby was oh he's great uh, yeah. well he was an incredible comedian you know yeah. who would have thought that because uh, i listened to his stuff on record on my record player right his yeah. stand-up routines they were incredible right well, so. he, he's like michael jackson the art <laughs> right. the rest of the person's awful but yeah there's right. just uh as a comedy fan there's just so many so many good good comics and, and on any night you can see somebody just there's been times that i didn't know people and the first time i saw people like there, there's a girl named ali wong that is so good yeah, she's awesome andrew andrew schultz is like some of these people come in and like first time i saw kyle kanane i was still doing pun jokes and he was doing <laughs> story jokes and i was like i watched him and i i went home and i just like i want to throw away all my material so those right. moments are like yeah, i wonder about that like you see some comedians in like I'm, I, I can see, I see that with writing and other people, like they're so good. It's like, uh, I yeah. can never even reach that level. Right. Uh, uh, now you just think you, well, the, the, you, the don't, thing, you don't want to compare yourself, right? You never, it's not a race. It's just a one person race. There's no competition yeah. in this because it, it, you're really just on your own path is the best thing. You know, when you start out, you get jealous and there's still a little jealousy. I'll see someone get that. And you always think you're funnier than some people. But to be good at this job, you have to remind yourself, hey, this is a solo path. And I've had older comics tell me, like, we were we were complaining about somebody getting something in a green room, like getting a TV show. And he's like, guys, that's a comedian on TV. We need to root for her no matter what you think no of her. What, because right. we need more comedians. If she does good, then they're going to go, hey, we need a comedian for another show, which could be you or you. And, we, and I always thought that was good advice. 
And right. like, and again, people have their own tastes. Like there's comics I don't like, but I get it. Like I'll see someone who's like, Oh, I wouldn't do that, but he's going to make a lot of money. So right. you just can't worry about, you know, you just got to do your own thing. And, and, uh, I mean, I'd go, like to go back and look at old shows because they're still good. Like the robot yeah. comic back in the eighties, dude yeah. dressed like a robot. Uh, there's some, the, the dude that was, that came out drunk. Well, I forgot his name. The guy remember he would just, his whole shtick was he was super drunk, even yeah. though I don't know if he was. Remember that? Who was that guy? I don't know. I know a lot. You know of I'm talking about right. I, I, I've, I've been super drunk on stage. Right, but he was back. clearly just being purposely super drunk. Right. No, I don't know, but I, that's the thing. Good hold. <laughs> good con- comedy holds up forever. You know, good it's like it holds up forever. True. Like if you, if Cosby, if you can get over the fact that he's did horrible things, if you just put, if let's say you never somehow you didn't know, didn't know anything happen about at him. this point. Like young people that maybe don't know any of the Bill Cosby stuff, if you just threw on, you know, some of his stuff, people would be like, oh, if you could separate the person from the art, I think his stuff would still right. hold up. You know, like, I can listen to Mitch Hedberg forever. Like, it, when it comes on, it just makes me laugh. Or Right. If that's the cool we thing. get you on a Netflix special, because I listen to Netflix um, on the radio all yeah. the time. That's like my, my gig, you know? And we need to, I want to hear your voice come on there. You know, oh, I would love soon, it, That'd be awesome, wouldn't it? Netflix and uh, the Joe Rogan podcast and Netflix will change your life. Joe Rogan, if, if, of course, Joe Rogan and Brent Tobler would be fantastic. Yeah. I would love to see you on Joe Rogan. Joe yeah. Rogan is a fellow comic too. I, I've been and watched his show and he he's there just like you. He has the same juice that he gets from the yeah. crowd. It's exactly the same. It's he's, one a comic, he's a good dude too and he's a comics comic and he he's a comics comic and he just know i mean he knows like once again the bigger they are the cooler they are i, I can't the people that are you don't want to deal with in this business are the people that book the shows and then there's like a little patch of guys that didn't make it that are like bitter that are bitter. taking responsibility you know if you didn't make it it's your fault it's nobody people that blame like because if you're funny you're gonna make it there's no so how did you, there's the, there's the classic, there's these like professional hecklers. I've been in, in Vegas at, there's that one dude, remember? He would go to like, he would go and purposely heckle everybody that got up. Like that was his, his whole thing, right? Yeah, you but that's- Had that happen the first time, you probably were like taking it kind of personally, right? And you had to, you know. Yeah. And probably- then when you start out, you're worried about hecklers. But then what you have to realize is the crowd's rooting for you. You have a microphone. You're funny or you wouldn't be a comedian. People always ask me, young comics, like, what do I do with the heckler? I was like, just be funny. Just, you're funny. Just believe, you know. And now, it's a different time. You can't, when I started, if a girl was mean, you could just destroy her. You can't destroy girls. <laughs> you can't no matter it. how bad they are, how loud the bachelor party is. If, 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 even if you're, if people around, let's say there's a bachelorette party, which is every comic's nightmare. Oh, and yeah. they're loud and then you just rip one of them you can do it softly but if you go to any woman's physical appearance no matter every woman in there will hate that woman the whole show for being loud and needing attention but if you like say she's ugly or fat you'll lose the whole room as much <laughs> like so if a dude's bad i could say anything to you, you can say I could anything, be right? the most ruthless person in the world and that's kind of changed over time because you used to just be able to destroy anybody but i mean again the heckler once you know that you got it, I mean, I love a heckler. I would love it because it's yeah. I, I'm built for this. You you're just drunk. You you got one line. <laughs> you've been that you you, you've been dealing yeah. with them for. You got one line you think is going to be funny, and that's the thing. They're like, "Oh, I'll say this," and right. I'll be like, "Okay," and then I'll go, and then it's just destroy. And then they're like, "Why? <laughs> why did you do this to me?" I was like, "You did this. You, you did didn't this, have right. to do this. Now you don't want attention because just a minute ago you're the one that wanted all the attention. So right. the heckler thing is like." And we're spoiled here at Comedy Works. They don't put up with it. They'll just kick you out. Just but, kick you out. but we're starting in Vegas doing those shows. Right. Like I, nothing scares me. We we did the worst shows. Vegas is the probably the worst part place to start stand up comedy. So my mentality that you can't phase. I mean, I I did so many bad shows. Where so it's like. Uh, nothing ever. It can't bother me. I'm, so I'm that, that's totally another good. point that I make on my show. All those shows prepared you for what you're going through now right people are going through shitty stuff right now they don't realize it's all for a reason preparing them for what's going to happen later and it's like it sounded like you were given the perfect little road journey of hecklers and weird um, crowds and audiences to put you where you're at now right 
But again, you don't know that in the time. So once again, it's so generic get, advice, but you got to keep going and just right. trust in the process of like everything I had about a week ago, I just had a frustration with you put out so much content, you believe in what you're putting out. And then like you, you just think you should get more listens or more people should be at our, and then I was like, that's not how this works. Just keep working. And then sure enough, instead of pouting about it, I just came down here and worked. And then again, it's like the universe is like, okay, I see what you did earlier today. You were going through it. You're always me, rewarded me, by action. How many gods are like, you know what, let me throw you this gig or let me throw you this opportunity because I see you working instead of, I can, I have two level house. This where I'm sitting now is a, is a podcast studio uh -huh. and comedy studio. And then upstairs is Poutville. And when I'm up there pouting, nothing happens <laughs> when I'm down here working. Right. It's crazy. It's when it happens, but it's like, and like you said, I didn't know what I was preparing for. I just, you just, I the first hecklers or whatever, maybe they got me and then you, and then you learn. It's like anything. That's why I tell people, you just got to do the reps because let's say the mic breaks right. or a light yeah. falls or someone breaks a glass. The first time you don't handle it the way you wanted to, because on the drive home, you go, damn, I should have said that when this happens. I should the next time it's going to happen again. And then you nail it. And then the crowd's like, Oh my God, he is so right. quick. That lady dropped a glass and he said this, he didn't say Mazel Tov or what all the, what everyone says. He said something clever. And then you're like, then they're like, how'd you do that? It's just being there. And then you go, okay, then it, something will happen. It, it's just all reps. And then you, you know, if you just keep going, you'll just get better. I just like, when I played basketball my whole life, right? couldn't make any until I just kept shooting them. And then I couldn't miss. What would be hard for me uh, would be, man, some political stuff right now is so funny, but I just yeah. want to avoid it. Right. Like there's like, it's, it, there's some, if you were to talk politics, then you're going to just be the political comic. Right. Then once you're in that territory, it's like, you're in it forever. Right. Once you go well, yeah, political, then you can't go back. Right. Politics so. or religion. <laughs> but the thing is like, again, if you, and I don't care about politics at all, but if I say Trump, you're going to get a reaction no matter I'm what. I'm going to get a reaction, but unfortunately they, or if I say Hillary or whatever, that's, it can go both Either sides. Way. If right. I say the word, they cut off listening to the joke. They just right. go, oh, that's my guy. If he's about to shit on my guy, I have to be mad, which you can joke about anything. You right. can still like your guy. I mean, I make fun of my mom. I still love my mom, my brother, like, you know. Right. That's the problem with it is then, and then people are like, well, I don't know why he had to talk about Trump. First of all, I don't know. I talk about whatever I want. That's the thing. Right. Like if I, I wouldn't do any politic jokes, but if you were in the audience and you said, Hey man, if I say Trump's name or something, or I say Hillary's name, you say, Hey, don't talk about Hillary. Then I have to not even my act. Then we're right. just going to talk about it. And then I'm not even that educated about politics, but like, if you tell, here's the worst thing you could tell a comic, don't do something. Cause then right. we have to do it. Then you got to do it. We have to, that's not why we, <laughs> we did this to not But I can see that. myself self-regulating if I was a comic and I'd be like, oh, I want, that is the funniest thing right now. I would love to talk about that, but it's political. So I can't, or, you know, it's religion, right? Like you said. Yeah, yeah. Like, but over time, then you just become a, a comic and you go, now I have to, that's our job. That's why we became comics. Right. We earn this right to talk about whatever we want. We've worked our asses off. You're not going to tell me what I'm going to say or not when you, you know, that's the thing. So it's more of a, like, if they tell us not to do it, then, then I have to do it. You know, I have to do it out of like the com the unwritten comedy rule of like, right. What's your opinion not, on like insult comedy? I mean, you see it come up even like at presidential, uh, you know, uh, events where they have this and, and even most recently at the, uh, golden globes, right. He gets up and it's not just humor, but it's just like this level of insult What's your opinion on that? Great. I mean, it's, it was great. I thought it, Ricky Gervais it was funny, right? Oh, so good. And then, and like, no one's above it. Like, and they're just jokes. Like uh, what he said, and I, everything he said, I liked that he was true. And he had an opinion on something. It goes back to my pandering thing. He's being real and, far and neutral. Maybe it's not for you, but part of it, I mean, he, he, it was great. And it's just like, and those are, you know, everyone likes to make fun of rich, famous people. It's right. You know, and I, if you're like, I never insult someone to hurt their feelings. Like I would never just come out and be like, you're fat, you're ugly, you're stupid. Good night. But like, if you heckle <laughs> me or something, you might, continue. you know, but in our world, that's like how I show love. Like if I mess with you, that means I like you. Right. You know, there's a couple of times in life I had to pull people aside and go, Hey, 
I only joke around with you because that's my way of showing affection. Like that's the comic world. And yeah. I hope you, un- and there's been people I have to take it off and go, Oh, okay. You're just not built for this. You're not too sensitive. You're so insecure of like, you know, it's not for everybody. But that's that's the me, humor question. When somebody that it was when that kind of insult comedy comes up is like, when is it the insult? And like, when is it funny? Like, <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? You just know in your audience, like if you can, again, like the world we live in, if I, so if I pick on a black person, the white people get so nervous and weird. It, it's just dumb. But then I'll be like, you want, you say we should treat each other all equal, but I can't mess with this. Like it's so right. the worst. Here's a, here's the thing that blows people mind blows my mind is that in the comedy business, it's, it's the only business I believe if you own a comedy club, the, it's the only business you don't want rich white people to come to, which is crazy. Cause any other business you want, right. rich white people, Interesting. but they just want to complain, man. Like they want to complain. I do jokes about everybody and they get so, Black people are the best audience. They they don't want it. They're not there to get offended. They've been busting balls, insulting each other. That's their right. culture. So, and I grew up around black people. I have great black jokes. And and I've never, I shouldn't say never, but I, the problem I have with making jokes about another race is not the race. It's just rich old white ladies that want to complain that don't, I don't know why he made that joke about a black, that made me uncomfortable. I was like, the black people loved it. You don't even have any black friends, you know, like, that's the kind of stuff you deal with. It's like, man, you just want to be offended. You don't, if you had, you know, like that, like, I like to do race jokes. I like to talk about everybody. And then I have to remind them sometimes, like, I do a joke about black people can't swim. And then all the white people get all weird. And I go, hey, let me tell you something. Every black comedian in the history of the world came up on the stage and said white people can't dance. And now... (laughs) well he, like we can joke like it's jokes and right. it's and it's a great joke and it's like that kind of stuff is like when you're just raised to be when you want to be offended for another race it's like if they're when not offended, bring why humor so into these situations sometimes we can make it better yeah that's we because make that's our between fun. cultures and societies races and genders we can come together through comedy yeah. not apart that's the yeah. thing about it that's the unifying thing that we can laugh about this together then we're going to start enjoying being in around each other and it's going to change right yeah that's, that's, and that's what we're all peace. doing that's <laughs> what we're all doing except for those people that but they're the same people that complain about everything you know like you said earlier some people just love to complain and we're lucky that our club supports us the best comedy clubs go i don't care about this yelp review i you have to take chances and once again, sometimes it just doesn't go how you think it's going to go. Right. I don't know if this joke's going to work or not. And there's only one way to find out. And then if it doesn't work, if I do 50 jokes, if I, let's say I do an hour show, I do 60 jokes. And 50 of them are, 58 of them are great. And two of them didn't work. That's pretty good percentage, you know? Right. But somehow those people are like, well, he did this one joke. What about the rest of the hour when you were having a great time? <laughs> right. And yeah. what about... 70 percent of the room that liked that joke you know because some of the jokes you liked 30 percent of the room didn't like it, it's like it's not about and again you're allowed to just go that joke i didn't like it and right. just move on with your life Nowhere but of course else. i've had a couple well, i've seen comedians it's a yeah. very small number but like that's not funny and i don't get it <laughs> like that's not like this dude is just weird or what you know that i've had okay. a couple like okay man i guess if somebody else yeah. laughed but it was like okay. you know <laughs> there's a podcast out there not for there's you po- there's, a, there, there's music out there not for you right the thing exactly. is you go you you take it in and then you go okay that's not for me and that's fine and then you right. just and you can i don't need them. to complain yeah. about it you could just go out and then if someone says hey i saw this comedian and you go i didn't like it it's i don't which is fine you can always give your opinion but then to race home there's no other really business that you, you know, like I said, you don't race home and, and send the house of blues a message. Like I didn't like that song. Like no one. Or, it's, it's like with any, every video of mine that I do, there's going to be one or three people that, that neg it. Right. Yeah. It, it's just, there's always out of every hundred, there's a couple people that are going to dislike. There's yeah. the disliker, the bad commenter, the complainer. That's always how everything is. Just like I think that there's mathematically just that's we have to accept it. <laughs> yeah, I think it's Neil Brennan has a great bit about that. Like you get on YouTube, and you go to like Beethoven, and it's like ninety five thousand people put thumbs down, and you're like, you're mad Where at are these people. people? Like, 
you took so the time to actually like, go and put the thumb down and, and took energy from your life. Yeah. And, yeah. That's, a, that's so. the one thing. I never read comments. Like, I don't care about That's anything. the thing that I was going to ask is that as a comedian, as a, somebody that's written a book, you're going to start reading the reviews and stuff and, and you start yeah. hearing what people say. And, and like, it's probably better to let that stuff go. Yeah. It doesn't I matter. Mean, if you're, you if you're following your heart and your purpose, who cares? You're going to let, when I started, you know, it's just some, not even a picture there. It's just Drew74869 wrote, this guy's fat or this guy sucks. Right. It would hurt my feelings. But then I was like, but now I just don't read them because inevitably, no matter, I mean, it just goes back to that Beethoven thing. No matter, you could put the nicest thing on there. Like man helps lady cross the street, saves baby and pets a puppy. And it would get a thousand thumbs down. Someone would be like, why yeah. do you wear that shirt for that? He's, you know, like, so I don't, that's another good lesson I learned is if you're creating, you can get criticism, not from the internet, constructive criticism. I don't think comic criticism is, I, it's just not for me. I, I, uh, right, I get that. I, I've learned. And then sometimes when people don't, sometimes people don't like me and then I can flip them, which is like, then I'll just talk to them like a person. Then eventually they'll be like, Oh, you know what? That was my bad. Or sometimes I'll just say, beat it. I don't, you know, just block yeah. them. I don't need that stress in my life of like someone I never see, never meet, watch 45 seconds of a 10 minute video and was like, I didn't like this. You suck. I was like, well, okay. But it's human nature to look at those three people that didn't yeah. like it. It's human nature to focus on those, even though 10,000 liked it. Right. It's just human nature. Yeah, of course. But then you just learn to not, unless you want to torture it. yourself, but like, I don't have time for that. I just don't want to do that. Right. Cause you're right. If I could have a hundred good reviews and one bad one, it's like I said earlier in the show, you come out and you're looking at everybody, everyone's having a blast and there's one dude that's not. And then in my old days, I would focus on that. But then a lot of times after the show, they, that dude would come up and be like, Hey man, great show. I was like, great show. You look like <laughs> you hated it. And he's right. like, Oh no, I, don't, I just laugh. And I'm not a big like laugher. I had a great time. You were awesome. So I'd never, right. instead of dwell on that one, and like I said, I don't want everyone to like me. I mean, that'd be an ideal world, but that's not. If I make right. fun of the Packers, someone's a Vikings fan. If I make fun of Burger King, someone likes McDonald's. If I, People are going to be like, so I can't. No one has a universal act where like, right. and, and it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. If, if you could get, if, if I think the majority of people had fun, you know, and then sometimes if someone comes up and is like, hey, that joke hurt my feelings, that's the only, I don't, I never want to hurt someone's feelings, but then I also just got to stick to my guns and be like, Hey man, that joke everyone else liked, or that's something new I tried. Or like, I don't want comedy advice from you because you don't know. I just did. So what do you do about those times when, you know, your people are expecting you to be funny? Like, I don't want to be funny right now. Like, do you, are, or do you always have to be on? Do you ever get this expectation no. or you're just with certain people? Like, you know, I could see that. Like, you're around. Oh, yeah, that's the comedian. Uh, well, that's why we funny, only. Right? Hang, that's why we had pretty much only hang out with each other. But no, every time right. I meet someone, like if I'm on a plane or something, and they're like, "What do you do?" I say, "I'm a comedian." A lot of people won't say it, but I'm so proud of it. I always say because I, I am. I'm a comedian, and it's amazing that I'm a comedian. So I always say it. But then they're like, I, every single time, say something funny. Say I something go, funny, right? Then I go. I mean, there's <laughs> there's comics will do like, "Where do you work?" Oh, you. You work at McDonald's. I wouldn't say make me fries or whatever, but I'll, I'll, if I'm around somebody, I'll go, hey, man, I'm just, if we just hang out, I'll be funny. Don't worry. By the end of the day, you'll laugh funny, but I'm not going to do a show for you. Or Right. Sometimes you just have to remind them. But usually, you know, like if I'm with my girlfriend or if I'm with my close friends and then someone's introduced me to me, and then that person says that, my crew or whoever's with me will just give a look like, oh, you said that? And then they'll be like, oh, sorry, I didn't. You know, people will call them on it. Like, you know, what's crazier is like if- Just if anybody out there, if you meet a comedian, don't say that. Yeah, don't say that. Just don't, don't say funny. that, right? But the other thing that happens is like, let's say if I'm on a plane, you know, to spend half my life on planes, I sit down, someone says, hey, what are you doing? I'm flying here to do a show. And then I'll see that person will try to be like extra funny with the stewardess or whoever. <laughs> but, but I just like it. But I don't- I don't, it doesn't annoy me or anything. Well, you're bringing like, out their funny, man. I it's guess like that's flattering. a good thing. Like, like, you have the power like, of funny, right? Yeah, watch this. I can be funny, too. So that's kind of always makes me laugh of, like, because there's nothing worse than, like, trying too hard. But I also am kind of flattered because I'm like, oh, this dude is bombing with the stewardess. But he's doing <laughs> it to try to make me laugh. So it's cool. Right, right. But that's yeah. cool. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, just don't. I mean, it'll always happen. And people think they're so funny when they ask. And people will be like, 
oh, you're not that funny. I, I, you don't, or I get, you don't look funny or something. And I just go, I pretty much then I'm like, okay, get me back to my comics. <laughs> like, I, I'm sure that there are times when you don't say that you're a comedian. You purposely don't say, right? No, I always do. You always say? It. I've worked my ass off for it. So you want to say it, right? First of all, usually it is a, it's a benefit. Like if I get pulled over, if I get a hotel rental car, people are usually fascinated by it. And, and I love it. I'm so proud of being a comedian. I never, a lot of people won't do it, but I like talking to people. And that's how I'm, I'm just naturally like to talk to people. And like I said, I'm proud of it. I'm a stand-up comedian, which I think is one of the coolest jobs in the world. And I've worked my ass off on it. So if right. you ask me, I'm going to say it with, you know, I, I was trying to write, like, you know, you have a good job when you're walking through the mall and like those kiosk people, Hey, what do you do for a living? Most people just, I always say I'm a comedian. And, you say and, that to yourself all the time, too. Yeah. You wake up in the morning going, I'm yeah. a comedian, right? I do. It all the, I, <laughs> I can know. see I, myself I, going, I'm a freaking comedian. I say I it all the time, it. right? If I have a bad day or if I get myself down, I'm like, I'm a stand-up comedian, man. I'm a comedian. Yeah. This, I did, I, I, I did I it. I am this all the, the way. Course. I'm a comedian. So it's like, uh, it, it, it's just something. It's so cool. It is really, it is. <laughs> it is really the coolest. And it's, uh, it's been cool to live vicariously through you following your Facebook adventures. There's so many cool stories about Brent, the Jersey story. Look it up on YouTube. It's hilarious. The Jersey story, uh, being kicked out of casino for life. It's classic, yeah. hilariously funny. There's so many stories. I, 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 you've said them so many times. I'm telling people to go and look at your videos and your YouTube channel. You'll have new stuff coming up and, we got a bunch of, Check so there's like, uh, the, I have a story I did on Comedy Central about trying to kill my dad, which is like, uh, which is I'm, crazy and hilarious. crazy and I'm very proud right. of it. It's got like 4 million views. It's a really, I worked my butt off on that. Then I have a bunch of stand up. And Since then, my pop, then has he contacted you about that? No, story? I haven't spoke to him in like 19 years. So he's out there somewhere, but he, uh, you think he actually saw it? Like he going through YouTube and they Probably popped up. Either. I mean, my <laughs> so family, you wonder, like, what are you thinking? I didn't, I didn't, yeah, I didn't talk to anybody on that side of the family, but I assume there's like a little curiosity because there's a couple times in life when I've like just Googled his name or something. So I'd have to, and I'd have to imagine people have told him. Right. Or somehow in life, I mean, his name's David Tober, and I, my name is Brant Tober. So I'm sure he know, and my family knows. I mean, the book right that side of family bought the book and then he uh you know i don't know i just hope well I it's an incredible story yeah i don't mean to make light of it but you did so it makes yeah. me laugh no, you know, right you know what i'm saying so first of all like you said in the moment of going through all that with my dad i never thought it'd get me on tv never thought i'd write right. a book like it's part of the journey and like that you know, moment the moment that scares that i felt the most was because you always had to bring money home and you had this money under your bed, like a ton, like hundred thousand, like that, like a ton of money, right? Like in the movies money, right? Yeah. And it's gone. And yeah. like in, in the movies that, you know, that means I'm freaking dead. Like I'm thinking yeah. like the mob's gonna come after me for this money. So that's on top of everything else. It's a, it's a family thing going on, but also you have this other, but you were like, I'm not gonna let that worry me. I'm just gonna, you know. That was the biggest fear is like my boss, is he going to go him. after me? Right? I love my boss. Your and boss was up, so cool. I right? looked up to him so much. And that was the hardest part was to tell him. Cause when I, so I was just a little backstory. I worked for like, kind of like the mafia. Like I was a runner for a bunch of professional gamblers. And the, one of the first things he ever told me is like, all you have in this business is your reputation. When your reputation's gone, you're gone. And when my dad stole $80,000 cash, you know, I knew I had to go tell him. That was, that's probably the hardest thing to let down you know, the person that he changed my life. Right. He, he, you know, in the book, he's the first person I think he changed my life and I'll always be grateful, but to go to his house. And I talk about in the book is sitting outside his house, trying to get out of my car to go inside. I must've sat out in front of his house for an hour and a half, just I opening imagine. the door, shutting it, crying. I couldn't, I just didn't want to disappoint him. And then, um, so that was like, uh, it was a crazy, it was, like I said, a kid from Wyoming, I never, all yeah. the way all this happened, it's so crazy. Just one little thing, the way the ball bounces one different direction or something. Right. I'm not, I don't do any of it. I don't know what I do. It's so crazy. So. Yeah. But it's also a story of whatever crazy 
doesn't matter. Don't worry about it. Don't let it affect you. Keep on going for what you want. Yeah. That's the story I get from free roll. Yeah. And it's more than just a funny story. It's a, a, it's a story of hope. And it's a story, a lesson that we can learn from what you went through that whatever you're going through, yeah. you, you know, if you have this certain attitude and you tap into it, then it's cool. So the yeah. next, the most important question yes, is Drew Locke, our franchise quarterback, <laughs> man. I hope so, man. As a diehard I, I got to hope, man. But there's, you know, that nagging doubt that you have in the back of your head. And there's all these great quarterbacks. Tom Brady and Phillip Rivers might be available. And I'm going, come on, yeah. man. Drew Locke better not hose it in the first three games, right? It's been so hard. <laughs> I mean, I moved back. You haven't got back. enough sample size on Drew Locke. Yeah, you know? we'll see. I've been back two years and they've struggled. I mean, I went to every home game. I went to Green Bay this year. And it's just so hard. Because in L.A., I just missed it so much. It's part of the reason I moved back home. And then uh, – to come back and just have them suck is like torture. But I think yeah, we're it's on the been right the track. hardest time as a Bronco fan ever. Even though we were sucky in the past, it's felt like I've actually like cut the connection with the Broncos a little bit. Like I didn't. Yeah. I woke up not wanting to watch him play, and I've watched every game right yeah. all the way back to like 1974. I watched every single game. Like if I was in Hawaii, I would go to the bar and find a place where the game is, and I would watch the game. Right? It didn't yeah. matter. But now it's like that. Like it was so it's so hard to watch that it was like. Yeah, we were just spoiled for too long, man. It just, was. I think we the spoilage made such it such a hard. great franchise, and but we'll be back next year. I hope. Right? No. Can't I can't wait. Yeah. I miss it already. I'm, I'm right. sad. Football's but over. I know you always get good tickets, but if you ever need some in the 500 section, just, All right. <laughs> just hit me up. It's there. It's the best section. Okay. So, um, yeah. But yeah, so if you're in Denver, go to the comedy store. There's a good chance that you'll see Brent. He's hilarious. Yeah. Buy his book, Free Will. Subscribe to his channel on YouTube. You have some CDs. Buy his CDs. Check yeah, out his podcast. You can just get them on Spotify. They're free. Right. Check out his podcast, The 31. It's hilarious. He asks 31 questions, and they're awesome. There's and so many other things. things. What's my that? New, my new podcast, Craigslist Chaos, is my favorite. Okay. When I, just get on, Chaos. I just get on Craigslist and go from town to town and just call people and try to get jobs. <laughs> I have not or, seen that, so I got to oh, check that out now. Very All good. Right. So there's clips of it on YouTube. If you go to my YouTube channel, there's clips. But the full episodes are on there, and then the full episodes are everywhere else. But it's uh, – it's everyone's most, I mean, everyone likes the 31 because I've had all the biggest comics in the world on there, but uh, right. people really like Craigslist Chaos now because it's just me off the top of my brain. If, you know, if someone's selling a rooster or right. if someone needs a ride to Washington, I just call them up and I, uh, and there's some crazy people on Craigslist. So it's, well, it's uh, like crank yankers are going back, yeah. like the whole idea of the Tricky prank boys, phone yeah. call. I remember sitting in Cheyenne with my friends and we would go uh, pull up, open the phone book and just prank call somebody yeah. just pick a name out and make some weird scenario up to get him to go somewhere right and then i remember just laughing and so that's that same idea right you know yeah. just well that's what i love about it it's so i never know where it's going to go so i just go i throw i start recording i have people pick cities i go to that city and then i just put call me in the search bar and then anything that sh pulls up then i just go from whatever call you know, like one of my favorite ones to do is if someone found like a phone or something, I call them and try to pretend like it's mine and they get so mad at me. <laughs> They're like, what kind of phone is it? I'll be like, it's like a red and black. It's kind of like an iPhone, Android. And I'm obviously just messing with them. And then they'll be like, it's not your phone. Why are you doing this? I'll be like, it is my, so it's just me like, you know, messing. And then occasionally All right. I stumble on people that I help them out or you just never know where it's going to go. Sometimes I call somebody with the intentions of messing with them. And then I. Sounds like another TV story. series on, is, is in the hopper, man, from that. Yeah. I can well, see like knows, hours of that, right? It's fun, man. I've got, I just released episode 19 this morning and they're just fun rides of like, they're good podcasts. You can stop and go if you're doing something because you're like, it's just calls for an hour. Right. <laughs> it's Zach random, Galifianakis but. doesn't have to be the only bearded one. We need to get Brant in right. the bearded That's game, right? right? That's one of the best beards in comedy so <laughs> thank you it's so nice like thank a you team. it's like a marvel team up two people yeah. from cheyenne you know um it's so uh you know i'll always love cheyenne even if i yeah. rarely go when i went back there i could you know i uh, went to the mall and hung out and it was so windy that day it was probably yeah. just you know i know it's not windy like that every day i, I still love it but um so everybody I, I actually might have people watch this 
from Cheyenne because I can see like the maps of the where people yeah. watch. Nobody in well, Cheyenne watches this, so we might actually get a couple people from Cheyenne to watch. So if you're well, out there, love so. you guys, man. Well, and congratulations <laughs> to you on your book and 10,000 subscribers. And uh, you know, as Wyoming guys, we just all root for each other. It's just exactly. it's just a mandatory thing. So especially as a Cheyenne guy, I love it that we're in. You know that this is so cool. Forever, man. Even if I don't live there. Yeah, it's 307. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I got the Wyoming hat on the Wyoming. Right. That's right. But it's just like, uh, it's if it's a weird thing where we're just, it's so cool to see people. 450,000 people in the state. I mean, it's smaller than yeah. like a small town. The whole state yeah. is. So yeah, it's like we're all, the whole state, it's all like we're from the same place, you know? Yeah. So yeah. it's, it's, uh, it's helped me so much with this, that the Wyoming bond is, is helped me so much. Surf right Wyoming. Now. One of the, yeah. does that surf Wyoming right there? Yeah, this hat is surprising. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right, so, cool. Very you know, cool. It's, it's a 307 world, so. That's right, man. Well, um, hopefully you can come on again soon if we have yeah, more questions anytime, about comedy. Man, anytime, I would love to and uh, keep doing it, man. I'm, I'm happy for you. I can't wait to get your book and keep pushing. Thanks, man. We'll, I appreciate we'll just keep it. keep doing it. Fantastic.